Now, I, I'm assuming that your family probably like never has any conflict in it at all, um, and, and that you and your family always are on the same page on every topic, and that, that there's never any unnecessary offense that is taken up with any of your family members. I'm, I'm assuming that, that your family is just smooth and conflict-free. Is that, would that be a... Would that be a... Would that be a would that, yeah. <laughs> Let me say... No, it's not. I'm guessing, honestly, your family's probably a wreck, like most people's families. I'm assuming that you've had your fair share of conflict. I'm guessing that, uh, that, that there's strife and there's, there, there's frustrations at times. But you know what I'm also assuming? I'm also assuming at the end of the day, what you're really looking for, whether you have it in this moment or you're working towards, is reconciliation and health and just that feeling that, like, you know what? Uh, struggles aside, we're family, Right? And honestly, even in the midst of some of the conflict, you ever have a conflict with somebody, whether it's with a spouse or kids or brothers and sisters or, or aunts and uncles, wherever it is, and you're like, you've got this conflict, but once you just kind of, the, 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 the emotions settle, you just get to the end of the day and you're like, you know what, man, sorry, right? Where you have that conflict, but that you know, they just give it a little time, let everybody breathe for a minute, and you're going to come back together because you love one another and you're committed to one another, right? That's family. And even in a room like this, I'm assuming that there's some of you right now that probably are in the middle of even some family conflict right now, just given odds, right? That you're, there's probably some of you that have some conflict within your family right now. And, 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 and I'm going to guess, and I could be wrong, but I'm going to guess that not, though you're in the middle of it, you're still longing for reconciliation there. For the simple fact, I mean, if it was with a coworker, you'd be like, ah, forget them. I'm going to get over it, right? But because it's family... You know, but I desire, right, that, that, that unity, that oneness, that, 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 that health and that relationship. Because God designed us that way, right? And uh, so whether it's we've been through our challenges or maybe you're going through one now, there's this, there's this, this thing about family that even when you walk through the mess, you, just, you come out going, you know what, but we're family. You know, you look around at, 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 the, at the family in our culture today and society today, and you look around and, and it's easy to look at it and just be like, man, this thing is broken. Like the family, have we out, has society outgrown the modern look of family? Some would argue that, right? The, the, the way that family is, that it is broken. But you know what? I, I would argue this, that it, just because there's conflict, there's strife, there, there, there's disagreement within the family, even on a large scale, it doesn't mean that the system is broken. It means that there's broken people in the system. And um, because the family was God's idea. So I can trust that the reason that we always keep working towards that resolution or that whether we're working towards it or not, we desire that in us is because that's something that God placed in us. You know, interestingly enough, uh, I'm not actually going to talk about our family relationships today, but rather the family of God. Because when we want to talk about the church, I would argue that there's a lot of similarities there. And, and, and I say that because it's a model that we have in Scripture. You know, there's some that argue that, man, the church is broken and the system is broken and the way we interact and the, the whole church thing is broken. Listen, I'm going to argue that it's not broken. It's just, uh, it's just broken people that are in the system, right? And so I, today my, my, my goal is that we would be able to see the church as it's described on a broad scale through Scripture that it would help us understand what it means like to live out our Christian faith right here in the midst of the family of God that he's placed us in. But here's the deal. As we start off, we get saved. Here, here's the, the two common um, maybe understandings. Okay, So you come into the faith on the basis that it is a personal relationship with God. Right? Um, and, and that's what we talked about the last several weeks. Is this, we're trying to make the main thing the main thing. We've been focusing on that here for the last month or so, looking at first and foremost that, that we need to pursue the heart of God. That's where our, our core values come out of this, right? As we are completely dependent on God in prayer, as we're dedicated to the study of God for the purpose of, of living it. Why? Because we've got this personal walk with God thing that is critically important. Right? You can't be grandfathered in to heaven, that, that, that God desires a relationship with you. Critical, 
absolutely important. And then in our faith, we learn this and we learn that, that God loves me and I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God, I'm a daughter of God. And, and then we learn that there's this, this broad idea of church. There's this, 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 this all followers of Christ who've ever lived. And it's kind of an awesome idea, isn't it? That, that this isn't just like some half-baked plan that we just bought into. This is, we, are big, we are a part of something that's bigger than we could even imagine. We are, we, it traces its roots back from God becoming flesh, dying, and then rising to, to, raising to life again. That's pretty incredible. And, and that we are a part of a, a family of God that goes back 2,000 years and it extends until we see God face to face. I guess cool. We're a part of this big global church. At least I think it's cool. Um, and so, and so we have, we've got my faith, my personal walk with God, and then we've got the global church, this, this all followers of, of Christ who've ever lived thing. But what I want to, what I want to look at here is, is that there's a gap in between those two things. And I want to look at what, what we find in that gap. Because if you were to look at the word church as it appears in your Bible, particularly in the New Testament, which is where kind of the church was birthed after Jesus died and raised, raised from the dead, right? As you look at the word church throughout the New Testament, and I, I wish I did my study on and got all the numbers. I don't have the, all numbers. I do know this, though, that it is astronomically higher, the use of the term church as it pertains to the local church as opposed to the global church, Right? So over and over and over again, we, we see this reference, not just to this general idea of church, but the local church. What is the local church? The collective group of committed individuals in a particular area called by God to be the context in which the Christian faith is to be lived and experienced together. In short, the local church is the place where we live this. And, and, and I want to I want to I want to chew on that for a little bit and just kind of drive home this point. We we tend to we use this phrasing. I've probably used this as well, and and it's not altogether wrong, but I think it carries some incorrect connotations when we say things like "This is God's love letter to you." I understand what they're saying. Right? I understand the idea that, that that God is it's that personal thing with God. But if, if we so embrace the personal relationship with God that we miss the context in which the actual Bible was written, and that is one of community, friends, I think we're selling, our, our, uh, we're selling short our Christian faith. Because I want to I I highlight some things with us, not just from a particular verse of Scripture, but from Scripture as a whole. So if, if you're familiar with the New Testament, you know how it's organized. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, the story of Jesus. And you've got Acts, the story of the early church. And then all the way from, from Acts after Romans, all the way towards the end, minus Revelation, it's, it's these letters written by certain apostles for a variety of reasons. And I'm, I'm going to point to you what the majority of those reasons were. They were written not to this general idea of the church, some were, but most of them were written to specific local churches on how to live out their faith. Um, in fact, First and Second Corinthians, it starts out this way, both, both of those two. It's the letters to the church in Corinth. It says, to the church of God in Corinth. It's not written just to a, a general audience. It's not written to a specific individual. This is how you live out your faith. It's written to the, to the church. This is how you be the church. When, he wrote to, when Paul wrote to, uh, in Galatians, it says to the church, churches in Galatia, to those local bodies of Christ, those local families of God that met inside the city of Galatia. He was writing to those specific churches. Uh, in, in Philippi, he says, to all of God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Okay, this one's not to the local church, right? This is a, a general statement, but then it goes on, together with the overseers and deacons. Oh, <laughs> that's a reference to what? The local church. Um, for, and when he wrote, writes to Thessalonians both times, first and second time, it says to the church of the Thessalonians. It's to the local church. Then you have books like Romans, Ephesians, Colossians. They all have verbiage very similar to that of Philippians, to all of God's holy people uh, in Christ Jesus, to these places. So they're general, but he's writing to the churches in those locations. How about first and second Timothy? It's right into, written to an individual, to Timothy, right? And yet, who's Timothy? Timothy is a pastor that Paul is mentoring how to pastor the local church. 
Like what we see throughout the New Testament is this emphasis on that living out the Christian faith is not just doing all the good things and stop doing all the bad things, but it's instruction on how we live together as a family. And if we take it purely as a rule book to how I live out my life, we're going to miss the richness of the context of the New Testament. So in order to continue to drive my point home, as if, if we haven't done it quite enough, I want to look at a variety of scriptures today that, that all have one common thing uh, tying them all together. I want to look at a whole bunch of references in a variety of different books written by four or five different biblical authors. You know, sometimes you read a biblical author, if you study the word very much, you know that there's certain certain writers that you like certain phrases you can find no no this is a phrase that shows up in a variety of the biblical authors because it was part of the dna of what church life was all about it's the phrase one another uh, let's take for instance in 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 the book of romans paul writes to the romans and here's just some of the stuff i'm just going to rattle through it real fast romans uh in chapter 12 he says be devoted to one another in love Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Love one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. But they probably weren't dealing with coronavirus, so we can table that one for, oh, we'll wait until that passes. All right. Um, save your kisses up till after it's gone. All right. Um, I want you to notice something. Just, just in this Romans, we're going to look at a whole bunch more here in a second, but just in Romans, I want you to look at these ones um, that don't require, like some of them like grammatically require a one another in order for it to make sense. Be devoted to one another. You've got to have ex- explain it. But um, you could show honor. That, that's just a general good thing. To love. We're supposed to love everybody. It could be to anybody. Stop passing judgment. That, that's something that, that could be applicable to anything. Accept, right? Instruct. Who are we instructing, right? And yet, they insist on putting in this phrase, one another. Paul insists on it. Why? Because the instruction is not this general instruction to anybody, but he's teaching the church how to live as the body of Christ, the family of God. And so it's not just separating it from the rest of Christian life. Okay, this is church life. This is my own spiritual life. But this is the New Testament was written in this context. Just to drive the point home a little further, let's continue. He writes to the Corinthians. He says, agree with one another in what you say, and that there may be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. He writes again to the Corinthians, strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind, live in peace. Uh, to the church in Galatia, serve one another in humble, uh, humbly in love. The church in Ephesus, he says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. To the church in Colossae, bear with each other. Forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against some. Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Do you think that the one another was kind of important to Paul? Throughout his writings, and so much of, we know what, uh, so much of what we know as biblical truth is actually placed in the context of how we live it out, not just generally in the world, but with the church, with the family of God. If we're not practicing these things in the context of the family of God, then we're not living out the biblical uh, mandate the way that God intended us to. But it's not just Paul. Here's Hebrews. It says, encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. I'm not sure if we have this one up here. Uh, as long as it's called today. Hebrews 10, 24, spur one another on towards loving good deeds. Hebrews 13, 1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. James, the, the brother of Jesus, he writes it this way. Don't, do not slander one another in James 4, 11. In James 5, 9, it says, don't grumble against each other. Peter uh, comes in, and he is using the same exact language in First Peter one twenty two. Love one another deeply from the heart. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Offer hospitality to one another. Close yourselves with humility towards one another. Greet one another with a kiss of love. John, another biblical author, he writes, have fellowship with one another. We should love one another. He says that a bunch, actually. Um, I hope you see the point. And, and, and not my point, 
the point that the biblical authors are trying to make here. And that is, and we read it one time like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, no, this was the primary context of the writing of the New Testament. Is we as a community lifting up collectively the name of Jesus in the world in which God has placed us in today. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to carry out our mandate that God has given us, then friends, we have got to do it as one. And we've got to be willing to to not just like each other. Oh, that's even harder. Not just love each other. We can love each other without liking each other sometimes, right? Isn't that how we do it? Oh, I love everybody who goes to Crossroads Church. I just don't really like that guy, right? You know, like, uh, and yet yet our instruction here is, no, 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 we are to invest heavily, not even just in this general idea of the global church. Yeah, I love all Christians everywhere but into the local church that you have right here and now. Now, I should say this. We've, we've talked about, we, we've, if you've been around Crossroads very long, you know that we talk about this a lot, right? This whole family thing, this community thing. Um, have I already said this? This is the third time, this is the third service. I'm getting all confused here. Uh, but we talk, about, we talk about community all the time. And one of, the, one of the things, one of the questions that I get back afterwards, the comments that I get back after, we, we talk about like in a pointed way, the family and community and how we live that out. One of the questions that I get all the time is, or comments is, oh, is, is there something happening that I don't know about? Is there some conflict or strife that you're dealing with? Okay, just to, just to relieve all the tension from the room, okay? There isn't, uh, that I know of, at least... Uh, is there a conflict that I don't, I don't know about? I don't, no, but there, uh, this is a preventative teaching here, <laughs> okay? Because I'm not saying, I think, there, I think there's really, really healthy relationships in Crossroads Church. Really, really real healthy relationships. But, but what I'm, I just want you to know that this is not pointed to any one particular issue or thing, but rather this is something that we must keep in front of us, that we are not an island to ourselves, that it's just me and Jesus and everybody else can just do whatever they want to do, but God has designed us to live in community with one another. Yes. Amen? Yeah. And so we re- read that all throughout the Scripture. The instruction of Scripture is, is not isolated, but it is, it is meant to be read and understood and it lived out in the context of the local church. Acts 2.42 has, uh, is such a powerful verse of scripture and the, and the verses that follow it. Uh, and Acts 2.42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I, I, I want us to think about those four things here real quick. Now some people, the breaking of bread, uh, there's, there's a, a differing opinion. Some say that's referring to communion. Others say that's referring to uh, having meals together in, in each other's house. I know today we really would separate those two things, but I believe both were happening in, the, in those contexts. They're eating meals together in each other's houses and having communion around that. So um, I, I, I want you to think about this. Acts 2.42 and the verses that follow are like, and the church was amazing and they all got along and they shared everything they have. Now, uh, be careful that we're not like, well, the early church was amazing. Our church is so broke. Four chapters later, everybody's fighting, and they, they're having to cre- create new levers of leadership and authority structures and organizational charts and all this stuff to fix the issues, okay? So even back then, it was a perfect system. The, the system wasn't broken. It was just a full of broken people. But we do see this, the season of, of the, this blessed life of the early church, and they shared everything they had, and nobody had any need. And they, there, was, there was meals shared at each other's homes, and, and, and there, was, there was life, and there was joy, and there was this sense of community that took place. And, and, I, and I hear a lot of talk and conversation about, man, that's what the, the church ought to be, and we ought to create that. But the problem is we want to create it for free, but it didn't come for free. It came at a cost. So what was the cost? Here's the cost. It says it. It is not like hiding. You don't have to like dig deep for this. It says it right at the beginning. It says they devoted themselves to four things. Apostles' teachings, which they eventually wrote those teachings down and it now has become the New Testament, more or less. So we'll say they devoted themselves to the Word of God, fellowship, breaking of bread, just being together, eating meals together, sharing meals together, and communion in there as well, and prayer. 
So out of four disciplines that they devoted themselves to, two we'd call as, as spiritual disciplines, prayer and the word, and two are social. Does that seem odd to you? Like this church, this movement that we are a part of today, this Christ-following thing that we're doing, it came and it exploded from a place of, of, of followers of Christ not just engaging in religious activity, but devoting themselves to one another. And then it says, and God added to the number daily those who are being saved. You know, we, we try to map out like all these evangelistic strategies, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but what if we just devoted ourselves to the things that the early church devoted themselves to? I wonder if we'd begin to see God add to our numbers daily those who are being saved. Fellowship and the breaking of bread. Okay, now the word devoted, that's, that's, what does that mean? Like if you heard somebody say, man, that person, that guy, that woman, they're so devoted to their job. What would that mean? You could assume certain things about that person. You would assume that they probably work more than 40 hours a week. You, you would assume that, that their mind goes there even when they're at home. You could assume that they, they care about the vision and the purpose of the, of the work that they're doing, right? They're, they're devoted to this cause, that, that, that they're, this work environment. They're thinking thinking about it before they go to bed at night. They're arranging their schedules. They're, they're working late. Why? Because they're devoted to their job. Right? If you say somebody's devoted to their kids or devoted to their wife, you assume that if I'm devoted to my kids, it means that I'm putting extra investment and time and creative thought and how to engage my kids and develop them and grow them and, 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 and energy into doing all these things, right? Because, well, that's what you'd assume if I was devoted to that. If somebody's devoted to their hobby, man, they, they're devoted to whatever it is, uh, quilting. Man, you could assume that there's quilts all over their house, right? Because, because you've given yourself over to investing in that area. So with that in mind, this early young church said we're going to devote ourselves to God's word and to prayer, but we're going to devote ourselves to one another. And in order to devote yourself to something means you inevitably are going to have to say no to some good things, aren't you? Right? That is typically how it goes. If I want to be sold out to one thing, things are fighting for your time and energy and attention all the time. If you're going to fully be devoted to something, it means that when other things come up against it, you're going to say, I've got this commitment. I'm devoted here. Uh, for the sake of, uh, of our conversation for the rest of our time together, let's define devoted this way. It is prioritized and purposeful. If you're going to be devoted to something, it's going to be a priority, and you're going to be purposeful about it. If you're devoted to your job, it's going to be a priority for you, and you're going to be purposeful. If you're devoted to your family, you're going to prioritize it, and you're going to infuse purpose into those things, right? If we're going to be devoted to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread, if we're going to be devoted to the local church, and listen, I need to say this as well. If you're a guest with us today, um, maybe you're passing through, you're here with a family member, a friend, and you've got a local church um, and, and somewhere else, or maybe you're just visiting with a friend and you've got another local church here in town. Crossroads is not better than any other local church, okay? Um, it's just the context. If you've, if you've called the place home, it's the context in which you're called to live out your, your faith. I've got friends pastoring churches all over, even North Lincoln, and they're wonderful. There's some great churches here in Lincoln. Uh, but if, if you've said Crossroads is my home, then you need to be devoted to your local church, um, and some people look at that and go, like, look at all these churches. There's so much division, right, in the church. No, all the churches on every street corner doesn't mean there's so much division. It means we don't all want to go have church at the Pinnacle Bank Arena every Sunday morning. That's what it means, right? Like, we've, we've got these smaller pockets to develop these community, but we've got to be devoted to the mission and the, and, and the call and the purpose of what God's doing here in this body, Right? And so if for you, if, if you're not connected here, you're connected somewhere else, then be devoted to that other place. So what does this look like? It means that it's prioritized and it's purposeful. So when we talk about the local church, here's the, here's the tension that we feel, right? Maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've seen this. I, I've seen this where there's a, maybe a generation that was more, more prone towards um, and maybe you're in this generation, maybe you've seen this or not, maybe it's nothing to do with generations, just general statements, but it's easy to get into that box where you say, I can't miss church, church is everything, and I can't miss Sunday morning. Like, I'm taking a vacation in 40 years because I can't miss Sunday morning church. Um, and, and, and 
others might see that and say, well, that's awfully legalistic. So I don't want to be legalistic. So now, like, if, if I have a conflict, if there's something else I want to do, then I'm just going to do it because I don't, have to, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, right? So if something comes up, then I'll do it. Like, Jesus still loves me. He knows my heart. And so we come to the place where we will miss anything for church, but we won't miss anything. I mean, we'll miss church for anything, but we won't miss anything else for church. And once we get into that place, now i got to start asking the question, okay, I, you're clearly not legalistic, but are you devoted to anything at all? Right? Because if I'm devoted, if I've prioritized something, then it's going to take precedent over well, a lot of things. So listen, I'm going to miss church on Sundays. I'm the pastor of the church, okay? So I'm going to take my family on vacation. I'm going to miss some days because it's not a legalistic thing. I'm going to miss heaven if I miss a few weeks of, of church in a year. However, I'm going to be devoted to the, to, the, to the house that God has placed this family in, right? And so we've got to have this understanding that if I'm going to be devoted to something, and again, this is not, like, what we're doing right now, this is not the church. This is a gathering, maybe the primary gathering of church. And here's another way to look at it. Some people look at what we're doing right now as a religious activity that, like, scores me points with God. Or even if you're more spiritual than that, like, this is a time of worship and, and learn from the Word. And, and that's good, too. But it tends to get legalistic in that mode. I, here, maybe this, this will help you. What if you redefine, like, what we're doing right now in your head as rather than a religious activity? But what if we just all decided this is just the time that we've set aside in our calendar for our, like, big family get-together of the week? That's what this is. And when you're not here, then we miss you. And when you're not here, you miss out on the richness of the family. It's not, don't, you shouldn't feel like this heaviness or obligation to show up. Rather, I hope that there's some devotion, not just to the activities that we're doing now, but rather to the people that we're families with. Amen? Not legalistic, but prioritized. Um, and is it purposeful? And when I say purpose, let me, let me ask you this. Do you come to church to receive primarily or to give primarily? We all do a little bit of both, right? There are days, again, as the pastor of the church, there are days I come, I show up empty. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you, okay? There's days when I come up tired and I need something from the Lord, right? I need something from the body of Christ. But I hope, I hope, that's like the exception, and I know it's natural, but as you're, you know, church shopping, that whole idea is weird, but whatever. Like, you're, you're looking for a place, and there's an element of it, like, is this going to be a place that I fit? Is, is this a place where I can receive something from the Lord? But I hope that there's also, uh, that eventually we mature past that pretty quickly, and we say, is this a place where I can pour myself into this family? That it no longer becomes an issue of, of I'm not receiving. Man, I, you see that. And you see people, church, you see Christians that should be way more mature than this, bouncing from church to church to church to church to church to church because basically what happens, you get tired there and then you find some spiritual way to say I'm not being fed in whatever context it is, but all that is happening is you've never, you've never put down roots. And you're still looking for the church to meet all your needs. And you've never said, I want to be a contributing factor of this family. And I'm going to choose to bless the people that I'm around. Is, is there per what is the purpose? Like, if we're going to be devoted to something, there's got to be priority and purpose. The priority is we're going to, we're going to make this uh, uh, important. I'm going to schedule this and it's going to be important. Um, and, and the second is that uh, it's going to be purposeful. I'm going to show up with a purpose, not to, and that purpose is not just to receive, but to give. Okay, so we, we started earlier with that, that, that my faith and, and the global church, and then we looked at the local church, and that's us, but there's still something, there's still a gap missing here. Okay, uh, if we can go back to that, that last slide there. It's my community. And so what I mean by that, and let me read what it says there. It says, the people in my life with whom I've intentionally invested time and energy to mutually grow personally and spiritually. I want you to notice the way that's worded. Uh, the people in my life with whom I've intentionally invested time and energy, not the people who've invested time and energy into me. It, it's all one and the same, but how it starts is different. You see, we, we, we have a church here, and, and we average 200-ish on a Sunday morning. You know, throw in 40, 50 kids. We've got 150, 160 people, you know, plus, you know, 
once a monthers who are all part of the church as well. If you're a once a monther, we love you. Uh, there's richness as you continue to invest. But um, I mean that in all seriousness. Uh, but, but this is not it. This can't be it. One hour once a week cannot, it's not going to fill you um, spiritually or, or emotionally. We'll just call it like it is. We live in a world that's very, very disconnected. We live in a world that's very, very um, entertainment, Netflix driven, right? We, we, we'd rather sit behind our screen than engage other people. And, and if we're not careful, if we're not, if we're not intentional, if we don't prioritize and not purposeful in our relationships, we, we could feel very, very alone in the world that we live in today. We're connected with anybody in, 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 a, in a second, and yet we still, there's that, that, that feeling of loneliness, even in the midst of the local church. It's because we say, let's say we got 150, 160, 170 adults that call Crossroads Church their home. Like, you can't have a close personal relationship with 150, 60, 70 people. You can't, right? Um, but you can with a few. So there's, there's, there's some that, man, you've done this, this local church thing right. You've invested in that and the purpose behind that. I, I even think of like, uh, you know, the, the kids that were sitting right here during worship, right? Here's how you know if, if the ownership that, you've, that you see in the church. Whether or not you have kids, is there every kid in that seat, are they, are they their kids or are they our kids, Right? And when we begin to see ministry that way, the, the uh, child uh, evangelism fellowship, is that, is that Liz's outreach or is that our, the, an extension of us to reach into Campbell Elementary School? Do you see the difference? Okay. And that's great. And some of us have bought into that. But now let me ask a question. Let me, let me narrow it down even further. That, that's great from, the, from the, the local church perspective. But when I look at Acts 2.42, they were devoted to having lunch together, to having dinner together. They're devoted to breaking bread together. The fellowship was not just a weekly gathering, but the fellowship was life-on-life interactions on a regular basis. Are you devoted, and this is the biblical language, are you devoted to developing relationships deeper than what can be established here in one hour? It's actually less than that. Right now, you're just sitting there. Everybody's just looking at me, right? Like, uh, you're, you're not developing relationships. So we're really talking about 10 to 15 minutes on the coming and going of church. You need more than that. Are you devoted to doing that? And let me give you a, a few things. Here's the deal. The same principles apply. Prioritized and purposeful relationships. Prioritized and purposeful. What does prioritized uh, in your community mean? It means being intentional and scheduled. Sometimes it feels like awkward if you have to schedule a get-together with somebody. Oh, let me, let me see my calendar. Okay, I penciled you in. That, you know, that kind of thing. It feels like forced. But let's just be honest. I don't do anything that's not on my calendar, <laughs> right? And at some point, you've got to say, if this is important, if this is important to me, then it's not just going to happen. You ever, you ever have this conversation? Of course you have. You ever have this conversation? You go, oh, man, good to see you. Man, it's been a long time. We have to get together sometime. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, take care. Let me translate, a modern translation of that, of that same interaction. Hey, man, good to see you. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, I'll see you next time we happen to, by chance, run into each other. Ah, yeah, good, okay, talk to you later. Same thing, right? <laughs> if you don't stop right then and there and say, hey, let's get together. Okay, let me put, okay, how about, how about a week from Saturday? Uh, I, let's, let's get together at this time. If you do not schedule it, I'm just going to tell you it's not a priority for you. So, that's why we offer groups. That's why we have Wednesday nights. That's why we do a uh, women's Bible study and seniors group on, on Tuesday afternoons. That's why, that's why we offer these things. But you know what? I, I, as I've done kind of a, a personal survey of Crossroads Church people, about half the people that I know who are connected in life-giving, committed, uh, scheduled, regular community are people who are doing it without the brand of Crossroads Church on it all, but rather a group of friends who said, let's get together because I value our relationship. It doesn't need to have a church's name on a gathering. What it needs is one person to take initiative. Relationship does not happen without initiative. And who better to take that initiative than you? And we all wait around for to be asked in. We all wait around for, for somebody to invite me in. But good intentions do not make for good relationships. You must show initiative. So, 
to invest, to be devoted to my community, it needs to be prioritized. Second, it needs to be purposeful. I'm just going to speak to guys on this because I, I, I don't know women like I know men. Um, I should figure it out soon. I got like five of them living in my house with me. But, um, <clears throat> but I do know this. When guys get together for purposeful, you know, sp- Christian guys, we get together. We love to talk topics. We love to talk doctrine and theology because we feel really, really spiritual about those things, right? Like I could talk with somebody like the tension between uh, free will and God's sovereignty and like just like, oh yeah, we had a great conversation. We're not going to resolve a single thing, but we have great conversation about it. But what's so easy for guys to do, maybe ladies do this too, uh, but I just know me. What's so easy for guys to do is we hide our real life behind theological conversations. So I, I, can, I can talk about our theories of creation while um, I'm, I'm stressed and overwhelmed and don't know how I'm going to get up out of bed the next day. I, 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 can, I, can, I can have these seemingly purposeful conversations about, about God and about what the preacher preached on last week, all while I'm thinking, like, I don't know if my wife is ever going to forgive me for what I just did. And we've got to be willing... If we want this to be purposeful, it's got to be Christ-centered, and it's got to be real. I'd use the word vulnerable, but us guys, we don't really, uh, the word vulnerable just makes us feel like vulnerable. Um, so, <laughs> but let me say it this way. We need to be real. We need to have a group of people who we can sit down with and say, I'm hurting right now. I'm confused right now. I've got doubts about things that I don't think I'm supposed to have doubts about, and I don't know what to do with that. We need to have people that in our lives that we can sit down with and be real. And then allow the Word of God and the community of God to speak life into us and refresh us. Guys, can I just... Can I just be honest? This is why we offer groups of any kind. To create environments where the body of Christ can get together with one another, that we can be real with one another and Christ-centered. That we can be purposeful in the relationships that we have. Whether it's Wednesday nights, whether it's women's Bible study, seniors, seniors group are knocking it out of the park right now. Two o'clock uh, here on Tuesdays. Come join them. Um, Come join them. There, is, there are good things that are taking place in the body of Christ. But it doesn't have to be one of our groups. You see somebody in the room right now that you go, I'd love to spend some time with them. You know what's stopping you from spending time with them? An invitation? I bet they'll say yes. Even if they don't think they like you, they'll, they'll be nice because we're in church. <laughs> right? <laughs> so just take initiative. messy, oftentimes moments of conflict, sometimes some frustrations or some picked up offenses, all laid before Christ in this beautiful, messy thing that we call the family of God. I I know you're devoted to the word. You're here. I know you're devoted to prayer. This is what we do. But are you devoted to to the local church? Are you devoted to the place that God has planted you to grow? Are you devoted to a community that's even deeper and richer than the the, the local church as a whole? Friends, God's doing good things. But he's using us, the body, his family, to do a lot of it. So jump in. Don't wait any longer. Jump in. You don't feel like there's a spot where you belong. Create one. And we're going to see God do some great things.